Now it's the World Championship or nothing. EU has always been pretty close. We might see a close season again. We need to practice a lot and be better than last week. A lot of teams have the chances to go top four. I feel like we have a lot of work in front of us. I think it's more about who's going to improve the most. We really want to go to Worlds. I'm just looking forward to having like a good split. If you follow the last split, you know that anything can happen. Train as hard as we need to to win the split. Qualify for the playoffs and then hopefully for worse as well. Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to the European League of Legends Championship Series coming to you live from our Cologne studio here in Germany. Cologne, Germany, that's where we are. I'm Joe Miller and with me is Trevor Quickshot Henry and today our opening Super Week of the Summer Split continues with six big matches coming your way. Yes, that is correct and the teams are looking to come out the gate swinging in order to fight for those spots at the top of the table and their shot at representing Europe at Worlds. And since the split has just begun, absolutely anything can still happen. But before we head into today's matches, let's take a quick look back at the action from yesterday. Starting right at the top of the table, Funnily enough, it's our last place team from the spring split, Millennium, that tops the table now with two wins. They looked fantastic yesterday. They had solid picks and ban strategy. They had a brilliant laning phase in both of their games. They showed good team fights, and I'm looking forward to seeing if they can maintain that high level. Summer split last year, they were playing as alternate. They came out swinging as well, so let's see if they can keep it up. Very true, and on the subject of winning, SK and Alliance also won their opening games yesterday. Yeah, so both SK and Alliance performed well last split. They continued their high level of play on day one in their opening matches, but they've both shown weaknesses. So we need to see if they can improve upon their mistakes that were made yesterday. I'm gonna use the word weaknesses here to go on to the next point, Fnatic. Are we still seeing a recurrence of the problems that haunted them at All-Stars? Definitely. I mean, yesterday, Fnatic, they just got outplayed in the mid-game. SK Gaming were behind 6,000 gold, but they still managed to find and force kills and towers, get themselves back into the game. Fnatic got caught out multiple times mm. and ended up losing. So it isn't panic stations yet. Remember, there are 28 games this split. Fnatic simply made mistakes yesterday, which cost them their first one. There are 27 still to go. So there is time, you know? Very early stages. Being a bit overly season. dramatic. I think. It possibly, yes. <laughs> uh, but for those of you guys playing in fantasy LCS like us, Millennium's Curb ended up being a total sleep. Deeper pick yesterday, he absolutely destroyed in his two matches yesterday on Ziggs and Fizz, netting 57.45 fantasy points in the process. That's possibly more than I've got from my entire team. What I'm very unhappy about is he's on my bench. I had Jezus as my oh. starter number one. Number two, I'm still very new to fantasy esports and we've got the Caster League running. Luckily, I'm beating you in our week one matchup. I've got NA players, so what? And I'm hoping the trend keeps up. You guys at home, make sure you head over to fantasy.lollysports. Check your teams out. Start playing around with week two because uh, I sneakily snuck Millennium as my team on the roster for uh, next week, just in case they keep it up. Well, we'll have to see about that one. And speaking <laughs> of yesterday's matches, let's take a look back at some of the big players that had you guys fired up on Twitter. First up was a huge first blood for Tabs in Alliance's game versus the Copenhagen Wolves. This one came from Romes88. He said, that amazing kick into the box, Flay and Hook. Awesome synergy between Shuck and Nif. This was the second most talked about play. Right now, they can see- Lee! That's just happened! How have they let it go through? The theoretical uh, hick, the kick, hook, flay, box. There is a second one. We totally just spoiled the number we, one we, play. We, we totally did, but <laughs> it is Kerb's incredible Baron Steel. In Millennium's match, it was against the Super Hot crew. I was very excited when it happened. I hit pitches that only Dolphins could hear, and it was at HTTR 2014. He says, best bomb ever. Play of the year? Confused? This was your most talked about moment in the European LCS. You can see it's taken low. You can see it's 3,000 hit points. 2,000 hit points. It's coming in. It's oh! got it. I don't believe that's just happened. How have they let it go through? 
I got a little excited. If Demon audience. doesn't believe, you know it's a good play. Well, guys, remember that you can always send your favorite plays from the LCS games to us on Twitter. Use at LOL Esports and the hashtag LCS Big Plays. Well, before we head into today's matches, let's check out the table after our first day of the summer split. Millennium, as I said before, sit atop of the pile in first place with two wins, zero losses after yesterday. And next we have a tie. It's Europe after all. Uh, okay, after one day, <laughs> we might be getting a bit overzealous there as well. Alliance and SK Gaming, one win, no losses. Yes, behind them, Rocket sits in fourth with a one and one record. And then we have a four way tie at fifth with the Copenhagen Wolves, Fnatic, Gambit, and the Super Hot crew who are all at zero and one. But that will, of course, all change today because we've got six matches coming your way, and here's who we're going to be facing off. We'll start off the day with SK Gaming taking on Gambit, and then the Copenhagen Wolves will face off against Millennium, followed by. Alliance versus the Super Hot Crew. If you're still with us, the second half of the day begins with SK Gaming against the Copenhagen Wolves. Then Super Hot Crew take on Ra Rocket, rather not a racket, and we will conclude the action with Alliance versus Fnatic. And you can of course find today's schedule along with player stats, VODs of past games, team info, articles, and much more over at lolesports.com. That's where you can also vote on today's matches. Yeah, just pick the teams that you think will win and hit submit. We'll check in before each match to see how you called it find out how you can join us here in the studio in Cologne to watch the LCS live. Just click on the tickets link at the top of the page and come to see the pros in person. Well, guys, we'd like to have your brain power as well because apparently we've got <laughs> none here <laughs> today. So head over to Twitter and tell us which European LCS team will surprise us the most this, uh, this split <laughs> and why. Well, Millennium surprised me yesterday. They came out swinging. They did very well. I think Fnatic may be up there as well if they continue this downswing. You guys at home, send us those answers to at LOL Esports and use the hashtag LCS. We will read our favorite responses later on in the show. So let's keep rolling then as we head into our first game of the day with SK Gaming facing Gambit. Yesterday, SK Gaming started the summer split with a bang as they took down their long-term rivals, Fnatic. Today, though, they face off against another rival. This time around, you have to feel that SK Gaming has the advantage. Throughout Season 3, Gambit held a winning record of 8-2 against SK, but this year, that record is much closer. They're tied up at 2-2. Yeah, now yesterday, SK Gaming really demonstrated that the laning phase is still definitely their weakness. They fall behind early in a massive number of their matches, but they always find a way to get themselves back into the game through strong mid-game defensive play. Just to give you an idea, look at how strong their objective control is throughout the spring split. Consider that they were the third best team over the entire spring split when it came to securing towers as well as dragons. Racking up 77 dragons and 245 towers over the 28 games. And this is from a team that started very slowly and were not considered to be very, very strong at the beginning of the splits. So on the other side, Gambit, of course, debuted their new mid laner, Nick, in the final game of the day yesterday against Rockat, who were a thorn in their side during the spring split, although I suppose he's a thorn is somewhat of an understatement considering the absolute destruction that they were handed yesterday. Yeah, simply put, Gambit didn't look like they were in the game at all. I think they had a composition that could push or get towers very quickly, but they never once tried that. In fact, they didn't take down a single rock at tower the entire game. Gambit opted into straight up lanes, 1v1s, 2v2s, and they simply got outplayed by Rocket. Jankos in particular had some superb ganks early on in the game. I do want to highlight two players though, Nick and Diamond. I was looking at them yesterday in order to see if they can help Gambit find those wins. And it was sad to see how little impact Nick had on one of his main champions of Nidalee. Zero, zero, zero. And unfortunately, Diamond just didn't find kills or picks when he and his team needed them. He was also first pick Lee Sin. And, you know, 1-6 on, on first pick Lee Sin is just not good enough. Definitely needs to step things up today. And with the departure of Alex H. Gamet has a chance to really reinvent themselves with Diamond now at the helm. To avoid another loss, though, they'll be trying to shut down Candy Panda in the bottom lane and Svenskern in the jungle. Alex H departing, there's like an era going away from Gambit. I'm definitely gonna miss Alex. Uh, he was a really cool guy. But playing against him, I'm probably not gonna miss it. I feel like they struggle now, but they definitely have potential. SK have a great jungler and a strong bot lane, but nothing else. If we will manage to stomp their jungle and bot lane, we will be fine against them. I feel like Diamond is like the main point in their team. Diamond does a lot around the map and he's the one making plays and team fights, etc. He's engaging. He's the one that kind of like made Gambit what it was. Like he basically innovated styles over and over and changed champions and things like that. Diamond versus Spanskern. 
they are both great junglers and it can be really fun to watch how they will manage to play in this new patch. I think they have uh, good players, but I respect only one of their team. Uh, it's Candy Panda. He's always played like a man. He's marksman, but uh, he's always in front line, even before tanks. So his play style is aggressive, and I'd like it. You know you're doing well if Darian calls you a man. I'm just gonna leave it at that. I also like the fact that Darian, the man who's in the front of his team all the time, is like, that's what I respect. That's what I appreciate. <laughs> you get in there, son. <laughs> Possibly doesn't die as much as Darian either, just to throw that out there. Uh, but guys, let's get onto it and check out the starting lineups for this game. On the blue side, it's SK Gaming with Freddy in the top lane, Sven's going in the jungle, Jezus in the mid lane, and the duo of Candy Panda and Enrated. And of course, on the red side, it is a Gambit Gaming. Darian up top, Diamond in the jungle, Nick in the mid lane, Genjo's AD carry, and Edward playing the support role. So as we move towards Champions League, let's talk a little bit about what we're expecting from this one, from the picks and the bands. I really just want to rattle off the power picks from yesterday. They're not too surprising. We've seen Jax feature in uh, all five games. Mm. Three of them he was banned. The two times he was let through, victory secured. Twitch featured in all five games. Four of them he was banned. The one he went through, he won the game as well. As far as the mid lane is concerned, we're seeing more zigs and twisted fate than we have been seeing uh, over the course of the spring split. So I think those are going to be the priorities for actually the rest of the day as well. We'll need to see if the teams agree. Well, let's find out. We're going to go into Champion Slate for our first game of the day here. Day two of Super Week. First ban out of the gate is actually going to be Thresh. Taken away there from Edward. Thresh Prince himself, not going to be playing it today. No, and yesterday Gambit banned Thresh themselves and locked in a Gragas support. While the disengage from Gragas being played by Edward was solid yesterday, I don't feel that it was a extremely effective pick in the composition that they were running in terms of how they played it. So we'll need to see what Edward gets his hands on in this particular matchup. Well, it's not going to be Leona either because that's banned out here by Gambit. Second ban out of the gate for SK Gaming. Trundle, funnily enough, a champion that Freddy has been going to time and time and time again. Obviously, don't want to get Darian on that one. No, definitely not. It was also something that uh, Freddy played yesterday. You know, he, he got, it's a comfort pick for Freddy. It's interesting that SK banned it away because it's not something that you're going to pick super, you know, it's not a high, super high priority pick. So you've still got the likes of your Lee's up, you still have Lee Sin for Diamond who we ran yesterday. All of the mid laners are still available. Nidalee is up, Ziggs is up, Twisted Fate is up. So we're seeing a lot more focus around the sort of uh, uh, duo lane as far as Gambit's concerned. They want to try and get Genji and Edward in a comfortable position, in a comfortable setup. Well, Cassidy won't be in the mid lane for this one, but that was kind of a given. We've seen a lot of Cassidy bans yesterday. And there's Jax, you mentioned uh, earlier on that he featured a lot yesterday, whether that was in the picks or the bans. And actually, it's going to be SK here with the first pick. They lock in Lee Sin straight away for that man on your screen, uh, Svenskun. Well, yesterday, Diamond's Lee Sin was not fantastic, I'm afraid. It's hard to really give any kind of opinion from Gambit's game yesterday, though. We have to it go is. because they just didn't turn up. Yes, I completely agree with you. And I think the reason I highlight it is Svenska, we know, can play Lee Sin. He was arguably the best Lee Sin player a year and a half ago, two years ago in Europe, you know, so he's really got the mechanical ability to play that champion. It denies it from his opponent as well. But when you've still got the likes of Evelyn up, which is another signature champion for Diamond, you know, it's 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 a possibility that they can run. I'm interested to see what Jezus and Nick play because they both like the long range pokey champions. I'm expecting a Ziggs, a Twisted Fate, or a Nidalee to be in both of these uh, 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 mid laners' hands. Although Jezus did play Kale yesterday. Not great in lane, did much better later on. So, for Gambit then, hovering over both Lucian and Gragas. Now, Gragas, of course, was played yesterday by Edward in the support role. Seems like he's really fancying that today. He's going to pick that up as his first choice. So it's not something that uh, I think is 100% is top tier for every team. You know, what we have seen it being played over in Korea, we've seen it being played uh, in multiple regions. We're on 4.7, and unless I'm horribly mistaken, I believe LCS in Europe is the first region that we're seeing on 4.7 live. It was just recently updated. So maybe Edward's onto something new that nobody else has discovered yet. But we'll have to see how it plays out. The one thing that I was very impressed with in the Gragas play yesterday is when Rockat were getting in the face of Gambit, they had the Dragon's Rage kick and the explosive cast from Gragas, and they knocked people away and they had great zone control with those two abilities. Well, this has kind of caught me a little bit off here. Yasuo 
and Aatrox being picked up. We, of course, did see Zazas playing uh, Aatrox yesterday. But Yasuo, not a typical Jezus champion, that's for sure. Not in the slightest. Um, we spoke quite heavily about Jezus regarding assassins during the last split, and it was actually against Alex Sitch where he ran Zed into Alex's LeBlanc and, and lost quite handily. In the preview video for this very game, uh, Jezus was saying, well, they've lost Alex Sitch, and yes, that's sad, but I'm happy because I don't have to play <laughs> against him. What I do think is that's quite smart because if Nick wants to run Nidalee, Yasuo is considered a pretty hard counter against Nidalee. You can use that wind wall to block spears, you can get in Nidalee's face, and you have enough damage to just burst her down in the lower levels. So it does mean Nick is going to have to play a different champion, uh, maybe something outside of his comfort zone. This could be Kale mid lane, it could also be Kale top lane. It is uh, a bit of a flex pick at the moment. Yeah, I well, imagine it will be, well, with Aurelia, that kind, of, that kind of seals the deal for us there, right? So, Kale in the mid lane here for Nick, and we're going to be seeing Darian playing the Aurelia in that top lane. So, Aurelia, of course, really coming back to to a, to becoming the top, the top tier pick for a lot of teams here in the LCS. Yeah, really rising in popularity. Four out of five games yesterday featured Aurelia. Only one game was not picked or banned. So, we are seeing her up at the, the top tiers of play. We need to see how Darian handles himself on Irelia because he can uh, get caught out, can get in, in a little bit of trouble from time to time. We also seen Irelia versus Aatrox, the exact matchup yesterday. Early on, Aatrox was doing well. Once Irelia against Trinity Force was able to bully Aatrox away, and that was Trinity Force versus Blade of the Rune King. So we need to see how Freddy handles himself, who, who's been playing a lot of Aatrox all throughout the spring splits and obviously now here today. Where is Kamni Panda going to go with this one? Looks like Headrated is pretty much settled with that Morgana pick. He switched over from Draven to Vayne, and it will be Vayne locked in here for Candy Panda. Now, Candy Panda has been a man who's done so, so very well. He's almost the, the unsung hero, I think, almost of the LCS when you look back to that last play. He's a guy who constantly does well, but somehow stays under the radar when it comes to a lot of the community's hype. There's not a lot of hype for Candy Panda, but he always does well. His vein is, however, one of the things a lot of people talk about. And Candy True. always comes out and says when he needs to find a win, he plays vein six times in the spring split. Four of those games are victories, and he's got a 3.4 average KDA on that champion. So it's a very, very big comfort pick for him. The one thing that I am kind of interested in is the support for Enrata, because he didn't have uh, Leona, because Annie's fallen out of favor, Morgana's a reactive support. You seldom see Morgana's flash into teams with the Soul Shackles to try and lock people down. The reason I highlight that, Aatrox, Lee Sin, Yasuo, they just want to go in your face. They just want to start team fights. And Morgana doesn't necessarily benefit that. Had it been a Thresh, had it been a Leona, it would have been a much better fit. I would even argue an Annie for the engage would have been strong. SK definitely got a strong team fight team as well as split pushes. Vayne, Yasuo, Aatrox, they can all split push. Gamma Gaming, on the other hand, I think they're a little more versatile. You've got burst damage from Kale if he decides to build that route, or if we go Ruan's Hurricane. Lots of auto attacks. And as we predicted, Diamond on Evelyn. So they're going to be looking to flank. But I do think if, if Gambit don't get a lead and they get pushed into a position where they have to defend against a split push, I don't think their team comp is going to be the strongest at shutting down like a 1-3-1 one, one push or uh, controlling all of the waves. So we really need to see how Gamut handles the early laning phase. A lot of AD as well on SK's side of things. We'll see how that works out for them a little bit later on. But well, guys, let's check in and see how you predicted this one to play out. According to the votes over at lolesports.com, 64% of you have picked SK Gaming to win this one. Hard to really say after yesterday's performances about these numbers. I think that normally people would favor Gambit in this one, but the fact is they don't have Alex Hitch anymore. They're, they're a transitional team right now, and I think those numbers are correct. I think so too. Yesterday, we seen the public vote not going in favor of Gambit, not, not giving them those massive percentages, and the departure of Alex Hitch has really wavered a lot of faith. Yesterday's game, I think we're going to write it off. They, they yep. fell behind, and... Unfortunately, they had a composition that didn't have tools to get back in. I think their comp today is much stronger if they do fall behind. And we'll see old Gambit would lose one game, bounce back and hit really hard. Can new Gambit do it as well? Well, we always said an angry Gambit is the worst Gambit to play against because they are pretty mean when they get in towards that one. We are going to be getting into the game here in just a second. I was even having a scratch there, <laughs> thinking we were already going in. But we were so close. But we will be getting there in just a moment. So... 
I think for me, the most important thing to keep our eyes on in this particular matchup is how Diamond handles himself. He went one and six yeah. yesterday. Um, we were watching level ones very earnestly because it is 4.7, so trinkets are now at 30 seconds. Yeah. So Deficio uh, was chatting to me a lot about the, the decisions that each of the teams had done. And, and generally we see sort of buff trades as mm. the standard, I think if, if you, you summarize it. Gambit on the other hand, they went the other way. They went, let's face check uh, alone with no support. Gam uh, Genja lost his summoners super early on, gave up first blood to a great gank by Jankos. He cannot afford to make that same mistake here. He cannot afford to just have a brain fart and walk alone into the river because that instantly just puts one lane completely against you and gives your opponents all the momentum they may need. And the fact is we always used to give Enrated so much credit for his crafting around level one. And I think right now it's very interesting to see who kind of sets the trend as to something interesting here at level one. Because as I said, we've seen a lot of, okay, invade, get a ward down, move away, maybe take a buff, Maybe not. A lot of teams have just opted to get the vision in there and not do anything else. I think SK might be a team that actually start to craft level one for themselves and start doing a little bit different. I agree with you. They do put a lot of emphasis on it. And the only team that really stood out as doing something different and, in my mind, adapting to the trinket changes was Millennium yesterday. Yeah. Kevin started with the scrying lens, uh, scrying orb rather, the blue trinket. And it's super, super smart. You get it at 30 seconds. You can immediately move in, get a, a vision on, a, on a, a, a bush, and allow yourself to invade without getting caught out, without getting surprised. And if it works out, you can find some kills. If it doesn't, you get wards down, recall, sell it, pick up a yellow trinket, and head back to lane. Nothing lost. And I'd like to see more of that happening, because I think there is a lot of strategic depth to countering your opponent's moves. If you can predict mm -hmm. what they might be doing, if you can predict, hey, they tend to like tri -bush. Let's let's try this sort of scheme, try this sort of plan. Fact is though, we're in day two here. Both of these teams only played one game apiece, so maybe a little bit harder to, you know, well, there's just not a lot to look at when it comes to level one, right? One opening move from each of these teams, yeah. not something that you can really rely on when uh, analyzing. Just a quick note here, uh, apparently Edward having a couple of client issues. We're going to actually be remaking the game here. Same pick, same band, so nothing going to change on that front, but we'll be getting in there shortly. One thing I do want to highlight, uh, just thinking about the, the, the blue trinket and, and the scrying all play. If we go back to season one, and I know this is a stretch, but in season one, if I recall correctly, it was Fnatic that actually managed to grab themselves first blood by using clairvoyance on their own tri-bush. Yep. And they baited their opponents into walking in there. They went, well, the standard was, we'll sit in, say, our blue buff, we'll use clairvoyance on the enemy's tri-bush, and then, you know, we know we're safe. We know they're gonna go for an invade. And you managed to pull their opponents into them because it's like, well, the, the default is, they're just checking, there's no ways you'll, you know, there's no ways you CV your own bush and face checked and got first blood. I'd like mm -hmm. to see that because I think it's, it's super smart, it's super exciting, and it's something that, it just comes down to talking. Sit down at lunch, talk about what you want to do at level one against Gambit and see if you can pull it off. I think it's, it's that simple. It's, the, <laughs> it's that easy, guys. That's all you need to do against Gambit to win the game. Just surprise him with a sneaky level one scrying orb, That's bait, it. and Done. then you're all good. But Quick at the same time, the thing is surely no one will fall flat and be like, Okay, they use a screen up there, so they can't be in that, but oh, wait a minute. We've seen this one before. Yeah, you, you, th you would think that. You would think that, but uh, yeah. I, 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 think, uh, I think there are possibilities. Anyways, the lobby is up. Teams are just going through the picks and bans phase once again to get ourselves into this game. And I think for Gambit, laning phase, I just have to keep reiterating it. I don't feel like they have champions that are going to be able to really 1v1 or deal with, say, a Yasuo when he eventually gets items mm. on the assumption that Jesus plays him to like the level Kautod does. I mean, Kautod was a phenomenal Yasuo. Same deal with Candy Panda. I don't see anybody that's gonna be able to 1v1 a vein on Gambit's composition once you get those items. And on the same token, if SK do mess up early, if SK fall behind early, uh, a lot of their power is gonna be taken away. So, so much importance on this early, uh, early stage of the game. Interested to see though how Freddy does on Aatrox, a champion which he, if you look back to the spring split was, Kind of favoring for, for quite a while, obviously, before we, uh, he was globally banned, taken away from competitive play for a while there, while uh, things were sorted out on his side. But he is definitely a very, very capable Aatrox player. 
Question is, you know, you go over to the other side then. Darian, who, well, again, it's hard to really assess what <laughs> happened yesterday yes. uh, with any real sense. So I'm just going to say he's just got his swag tash on, so he's looking good. And we'll see if it carries through in game. That's that's all that's going to matter. I'm actually going to put myself in a little bit of a spot. I believe Freddy ran Aatrox for the first time in the spring split against Gambit as well. I'm, I'm pretty confident on that one. And it, it's just a champion that, that Freddy plays really well. He gets in the, the, the grill of his opponents. He, he knows how to tank and how long to, to be in the faces. And, you know, if you look at his most played champions, 11 games on Renekton, five games on Trundle, five games Shivana. He's getting the five or six games on Aatrox this year. Mm. He, he just really, really likes those beefy bruiser in your face champions. And that's exactly what is required in the current state of competitive play. AP champions are theoretically viable, but they are by no means the standard as far as top lane is concerned. So Freddy's in his element and he's making it work. Yeah, and I, I kind of like the fact that while there are other options, while you know the likes of Lulu Top, for example, definitely viable, Freddy's sticking to what works for him, yes. what he plays the best of. And if we look at just to compare that, for example, someone like Youngbok, who yesterday played the Lulu, really didn't have any kind of impact on the game whatsoever. And we know Youngbok is a fantastic bruiser yeah. player. We know how strong bruisers are right now. I really like that Freddy is really sticking to his roots, so to say. I completely agree. And more importantly, he's making it work, picking up wins along the way as well. So here we go then. Into game. It's our first matchup of the day. SK Gaming versus Gambit. An important matchup. Probably you'd say more for Gambit than SK Gaming coming into this one after they, let's be honest, got thrashed yesterday by Rockout. They were not really involved in that game whatsoever. They kind of bowed out without really showing us any of the typical Gambit flair. Something tells me though, as it seems to be the recurring theme with Gambit, that they come back after a hard defeat so much better. Well, we'll see if, uh, if they can pull it off. They are without Alex, of course. So bouncing back from that hard defeat without your front man, without their you know, old uh, mid laner is going to be tough. So as far as the starts, very defensive across the board. Um, Genja this time is actually sitting in the same bush that he tried to face check yesterday. And you'll notice that no blue wards, uh, no blue trinkets, no red trinkets. So it, both of these teams not willing to give up anything or, or run the risk of getting caught out. So there's uh, one man waiting in the death was Svenska, who pretty much does that every single time. You'll see him sitting there inside of that brush. The ward did go down. They spotted that one actually coming into play. So. SK Gaming really having a good time with that one, at least knowing where a little bit of Gambit Spurgeon has gone down from the start of things. Edward and Nick here also just hanging around off to the side, going to ward straight down there into the death brush on the bottom side of river. Looks like it's going to be a fairly passive start once again. And it does look like we're going to get straight up head-to-head -head matchups again. So Gambit yesterday went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Rocket. Uh, they made some mistakes early, which cost them. They lost the landing phase and it just spiraled out of control from there. We need to be watching very heavily how these lanes play out. I feel like Genja and Edward should be able to bully Candy Panda and Enrated around thanks to just the, the, the immense lane presence that Illusion offers you. And I absolutely love the zone control that a, a support Gragas offers with those barrels. If you use them you know, to poke down the AD carry. Edward did a great job of making Celebre's life difficult yesterday. So we'll keep our eyes on how this lane matchup plays out and who gets the early advantage. And Gambit pushing that wave pretty early on in this one. See Candy Panda there, just using that tumble, which is leveled up here first. Get out of the way of those barrels. And we see with that first wave down, Genja, the one that's got a slight CS lead right from the very beginning. As you mentioned, those barrels are going to be potent, always going to be a factor. In fact, they've got a huge, huge range to them, a huge area of explosion there that you really need to back away from. There's a belly slam coming in, barrel landing as well, and Candy Panda already down to half. And this is exactly what Edward did yesterday. He was able to give Genja some early, an early CS advantage but it never equated to anything more. Gambit didn't take a single tower of Rocket yesterday, not a single tower, and they had a Gragas and Caitlyn as their duo lane. So we need to see how it works out. We do see Nick already being jumped on. Actually managing to get away. Cute landing from Svenska in there, but Diamond is starting to move. We did see, however, Nick using his flashes. Edward gonna once again 
Yeah, the belly in there and uh, slamming in against Candy Pan, who remains at just less than half HP. Diamond, in the meantime, doing what Diamond was always famed for, doing what Diamond does best, I think we can say. Oh, trying to wait out there, actually managing to it. get it as well. Nicely yeah. done. Smite stole, just stood outside of vision radius, so uh, small advantage given there to Diamond. One thing I do want to note, that very point-blank body slam was actually not spell shielded by unrated, so we'll need to see how that works out. The one thing I want to note is, obviously, that spell shield will prevent the knock away from the explosive cast. So if Enrated gives it to the likes of Jezus or Freddy in the mid to late game team fights, they can really get in the thick of things and not be bothered by Edward's displacement. So there is that element to the support Morgana pick that is obviously going to become absolutely invaluable. Let's see if Jezus, I don't think he's in trouble. He doesn't really seem like he's pushing this wave super hard. Yeah, he got Flash as well, if he should need that one. Diamond just stalking off to the side, though, and we'll see if he can actually get too involved in this one. Jez is actually going to hold back, puts down the wind wall. Here comes Diamond from the side. I think Jez is safe, as I said. Got Flash available if needed. Actually just ends up burning through a pot there. No real imminent danger coming. Lost a lot of hit points, so he's going to be able to farm underneath the tower. I want to mention a, a, a cute little interaction between a Kale and a Yasuo. Yasuo's wind wall will block projectiles, things that are being fired. And when Kale activates uh, her Righteous Fury of the E, it is not count as a projectile. She is still considered a melee champion with a ranged champion's distance. So those Righteous Fury swings are not blocked by the wind wall. So that's why you'll notice when Jezus got ganked earlier, he just took such a massive chunk of damage. This top lane then being quiet up until now, of course. Freddy playing the Aatrox against Darian on Irelia. That may change though. We have Svensko coming in, but Darian's all the way back on his turret already. This is going to have to be a dive if they want some action. Uh, they have the ability. Because of the blood well on Aatrox, you can dive, tank up the turret, and have that sort of built in GA to reset the aggro. I do want to note that we're seeing the same thing we've seen yesterday. Uh, Aatrox winning early on against Irelia up until level 6. Kenji takes a lot of damage, but this is scary. A lot of damage coming in, but look at SK from that one. Edward still up at around full HP, only Genja taking damage from Gambit's side. But both uh, Candy Panda and Enrated here are already low. And seen a couple of times, Edward, despite the sheer size of the Gragas, managing to dodge those bindings a couple of times. And actually, Genja then uh, was the one that caught him. Scumbag Eddie. Yeah, scumbag Eddie, indeed. And uh, just to finish that point on the top lane, it was uh, the same story yesterday. Aatrox won early, and once the Irelia picked up a Trinity Force, was able to actually out-trade and 1v1 the Aatrox. We'll see if Darian can pull it off, but his mana pool is very low, so he's using it to keep up that hidden style to use those blade surges. And of course, Freddy being mana-less means he's always going to be in a slightly stronger position when it comes to uh, sustaining in lane. Very, very scary for SK Gaming. Candy Panda and Rated sticking around here for the farm. We do have Edward on Ignite here, so that is definitely worth bearing in mind. Also, bear in mind that Svenskren is there on that top side. Look how low Candy Panda's gone from this one. One barrel would actually finish him off at this point, I think. In the end, though, they decide, okay. Can't quite recall right underneath the turret when those barrels can come in. Gamit doing a good job of controlling this lane right now. Very importantly, they're in absolute control. There's no doubt about it. Genji and Edward are using that lane dominance that you expect from a Lucian against a Vayne. <laughs> Darren can't even recall. Uh, in addition, Edward's doing a good job with those barrels. Uh, it, is, it is probably my favorite thing about support, Gragas, is the zone and area of control that you offer. Because Candy Pan and Raiders have to spend time dodging, Freddy's actually going, I thought he was going aggressive there. He's already used his Massacre just to sustain the lane. But we need to see Gambit. They need to either get the tower and then start rotating to push other towers and uh, snowball that advantage further. Or maybe it might open up an early dragon. If they can push Candy Pen and Rated away and pull Diamond to the dragon pit, they may be able to go for that as well. Well, we're on that topic as well. Just to note that both top laners do have the teleport as is pretty standard by now. And there are the wards down, actually both support seeing that the other had warded there. So they both know that they've both got vision of that dragon area, which may slow the things down somewhat. There is a teleport actually being used actually by Darian to get himself back into this top lane. Picking up a chain vest, picking himself up also the health crystal and the long sword as well. So working his way slowly, uh, uh, or we should probably say a little bit slower than you may expect towards the Trinity Force because of that chain vest. Yeah, he needs to get some sort of uh, defensive stats against that Aatrox. The other thing is, that chain vest is quadruply effective 
because there are four members of SK that have physical damage. Yeah. And yes, Morgana's AP damage, but come on, she's not a burst match. We're not expecting support Morgana to be blowing people up or popping them like we would expect from a Kale. So we'll, we'll see how SK handles this all physical composition. Keep in mind, Vayne does have true damage and Yasuo does have that armor penetration built into his ultimate. So there are some tools that they can make use of, but it is a ticking time bomb. By time multiple members of Gambit have Sunfire Capes, Thorn Males, and Randian's Omens, it becomes so much more difficult to secure kills. So uh, very, very important for uh, SK to get a lead. And as we talked about, push and Candy Fan and Rage back. And it looks like Gambit has got great presence on the strike. They do, but that ward was down and Svenskun is actually waiting and we see already that Gambit decided, okay, maybe a little bit too risky for this one. Diamond at half HP, actually, and Raids are going to take a lot of damage. Force use his flash, but it's Candy Panda they've gone for. He's going to go down. It's Edward with the Ignite that picks that one up there for first blood. Now Nick having to go here at Jezus. We see Svenskun and Diamond going very, very low. In the end, it's Svenskun that falls first. And just like that, Gambit pick up two kills. And Rated was not on the same page as the rest of the team. Interestingly, Genji and Edward didn't respond to the dragon instantly. They hung back in the lane and they waited to rotate up. The moment Candy Pan and Rated had left, they became split up and it allowed Genji and Edward to split them apart and the rest of SK came in from you know odds and, and, and ends angles. They simply didn't stay grouped enough. So Gambit, with a very strong start to the game, grabbed themselves first blood, grabbed themselves a follow-up kill and this is a much, much, much better 10 minutes than we've seen yesterday against Rockat. Did they get one kill yesterday? Serves yes. yeah. So they doubled that already after 10 minutes here against SK Gary. Definitely a different start here for Gambit, that is for sure. And as we said before, you can never really count Gambit out, however horrible they look on the day before. That's just how Gambit have traditionally done things at pretty much every single tournament they've ever played. Yes, and it was very important to note that Edward and Genja had a level advantage over uh, Candy Pad and Rated. Going into that fight, Edward already had access to his ultimate, and Rated was only level 5. They, you know, so it was a good position for them to be in. They have taken advantage. I do want to remind everyone, SK Gaming standard is to fall behind early and win the mid game thanks to their positional map play. So, you know, it is 1,200 gold at the moment. That's a dragon or a tower in the distant future. So we'll see how effectively they can get themselves to objectives. Neither have been secured yet. Edward once again catching the binding. We see Diamond headed down towards his bottom lane as well. This could be a dangerous time for SK Gaming. Sweeping lens was uh, switched over to actually by both supports at this point of things. And there is the Dragon going to be starting up once again. Looks like they're going to go for a dive here on towards Diamond. Uh, that's on towards Darien. Sorry, it was Freddy that was tanking up the turret initially. Darien going low from this one. Freddy, is he going to get his blood well pumped? Actually won't. We'll get out in time. It done nicely there to pick up the kill. But in the meantime, Gambit just went straight to Dragon. Yeah, and this is, uh, this is normal Gambit. Lose Darien, grab yourselves a Dragon. The one thing that is important to note is SK were able to secure themselves their tower. So at the end of the day, I think you prefer SK's position. Now, Candy Panda may get knocked backwards. Let's see if the uh, Black Shield is good, and it is. There's no damage coming in, but no real control. However, Diamond once again headed down towards this bottom lane. The wave already pushing in Gambit's favor. That's going to go under the tower right now. The question is will Diamond want to get involved in this one? Will they go for the kill? Pretty much answer that. Diamond starts to back away. So, the reason I feel that SK will be happy with a tower trade for Dragon is it opens Freddy up. He now has options. Does he want to go for counter jungling uh, along with Sven Skeren into Gambit's jungle? Does he want to try and push other waves? Does he just want to sit, plant some wards, and play the split pushing Aatrox that I'm somewhat expecting him to play? And if anyone ever responds to Freddy in that top lane trying to get that inner turret, it's going to open up the middle and the bottom turrets. Maybe a dragon is going to take control of. So the key now is for Gambit to make sure that whatever decision they commit to, it has to be swift, it has to be very quick, because if Freddy buys enough time, SK could take another objective elsewhere on the map and close this goal. This is a very, very aggressive bottom lane from Gambit. Not the the traditional bottom lane style that we're really used to from the Russian side. If you look there at the CS, in fact, we'll forget that. No, we won't, because it's not in trouble. 111 to 66 CS down in the bottom lane. Candy Panda is miles behind Genja. Yeah, and it's just the lane matchup. It really, really is in favor of both Genja and Edward, and they've played it well. They haven't got the tower yet, but they will have the option to do that a little later. 
the one thing I want to see is how Genji transitions into this mid game. So it's been a while since we've seen Genji really dominate anybody. And in this setup, he's doing it correctly. We do see SK, they steal away that blue buff actually. So snuck that away from underneath Gambit's noses. A small advantage in their favor. One thing to note, there's not traditional knockups on the side of SK. You've obviously got Dragon's Rage Kick, can activate the uh, 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 Yasuo ulti. You've obviously got the knockup from Aatrox, but you can also do it from a Vayne Condemn. If your reaction speed is quick enough and it's planned, you can condemn somebody, and while they're displaced, you you can also activate that Yasuo ultimate. So there is possibilities for Jesus to play. He's not even on CS with Vayne Condemn. We haven't seen him blow anyone up yet. So after that last blue buff was stolen away by SK Gaming, interestingly enough, Gambit going there for the steal. Actually, they gave it over to Diamond in the end. He smited that one away, so it's going to be no blue buff for Nick. Obviously, his opponent in that mid lane not going to have a blue buff either. And then we see in this bottom lane once again how much trouble Candy Fanner and Enrated are really having down there. Edward keeping them zoned out constantly until that wave eventually gets pushed up to them. The, the question is, what does Candy Panda do now? Because he's so far behind on CS, once this tower falls down, SK will have the option to let the wave sort of push. I think Candy Panda may even want to try to freeze the lane. Oh, they're diving on Darien in top. Oh, this is bad, bad news for Darien. Will <gasps> he get away? Oh! Wow! <laughs> wow, that was ridiculously close coming out there. The kick from Svenskren. Thinking he'd got enough damage there to actually finish off. Turns out he didn't quite have the damage to finish him off. And that will be Darian escaping by the skin of his teeth. But they're going to get the tower nonetheless. Okay, so at the end of the day, yes, they didn't get a kill, but they got something that is more valuable. The tower was secured. The bottom tower was also taken out for Gambit, and the minion wave is pretty substantial. So we'll see if Edward and Genja can push it into the tower. This is a very smart move. Try force it to reset, and... and reduce the, the amount of chance that Candy Panda has of controlling the tempo of that lane. Candy Panda is going to take a long time before he's enabled because he doesn't even have a Blade of the Ruin King yet and now Nick is the one that's been dived on. A little bit of trouble however, Diamond is there with him. Windwall actually coming down, Knocker comes through. Actually Darian going to get involved on this one. Jezus down to half HP, Freddy at half as well but of course he does have his blood well. Finally Edward coming along to support as well. He may have got them low enough here to actually have a good go on the tower. That was a two-man knocker, but they didn't go. They've got Freddy. Throwing Freddy back there into Bloodwell. Actually going to be popped. The question is, can they control him enough as he comes back up? And he can. It's Darian that gets the kill in the end. Cully comes out from Genja, and they take the turret as well. Very smart play by Gambit. They were trying to set up a gank onto Jezus to begin with. But as multiple members of SK flooded into the mid lane, Gambit were close enough to respond grab themselves a kill and also take the tower. A very good show of force. SK looked disjointed. If you go back to the dragon fight very early on, they weren't on the same page. If you go back to the mid lane fight a few moments ago, it felt like they were doing slightly different things or it was just panic modes. They realized they'd bitten off more than they could chew and they needed to get out. Down some of the items here now. Genja is a country mile ahead of Candy Panda, as we were saying earlier on. Look there's to finish for him now with those Berserker Greaves as well. Candy Panda, of course, moving up towards that Blade of the Rune King, but he is way, way, way off. 152, let's call it 100 CS here. That is a nice little lead for Genja, and I say little lead in the loosest of terms because, of course, 50 CS is. Well, a lot of CS in the end of it. Yeah, it's so about two and a half kills worth of gold, roughly. And and the one thing that's very important to note is that Jezus has just hit his first spike. Uh, on his previous back, he completed both his Static Shiv as well as his Berserker's Grief. So he's going to have a little more mobility and attack speed to move around the map. And that Static Shiv is his first core item. If he decides to go towards the um, Infinity Edge next, he should be able to get to a 100% crit rate. Regardless, Dragon has respawned. Gambit secured the first one uh, earlier in the game, thanks to pushing SK away. SK are a little out of place, but in a better position to start a fight. Freddy has teleport as well. Let's see if they go in. Oh, Svenskren throws out his Q. Gambit wisely just sitting back and waiting for that one. And didn't, done it perfectly there, Gambit. Nothing to really complain about from that one. Second Dragon of the game goes their way. SK were timid. SK really hesitates in that situation. Freddy couldn't gain any further advantages in the top lane because both towers are down. He did manage to steal away the red buff, so, you know, all props to there, he's denied that resource. But now he's in trouble. He's got no blood well either, but he can just dark flight over the wall anyway, so difficult to catch that uh, champion. Freddy now, I think, needs to try and 
maybe push other lanes. Maybe try and get to this mid lane tower down or bottom lane tower down. It does look like SK3. They've stacked up four members in this mid lane and Candy Panda will be alone in a side lane, I think, for a very long time. He needs a lot of CS to point better. Yeah, a lot of harm to be caught up on on that one. And Gambit actually starting to move back towards this middle lane. SK, of course, have seen them coming up there. Thanks to that ward just by the Dragon Pit. And that's going to be enough to actually force SK to just back away and alleviate some of that pressure that they were putting down onto the middle outer tower. It's very important to note that Gambit have got a 4,000 gold lead and they've got a composition that is more balanced than SK's. So Gambit's, not only have they got, you know, uh, uh, money in the bank more than SK Gaming, but they can they get more value from every piece of armor because it works against every single member of SK Gaming. So once we start seeing more of these armor items uh, picked up for Gambit, that gold lead actually becomes even larger because of how effective it is against the entire SK Gaming team. So unless SK can really get something back in the next sort of five to 10 minutes, it, it, it is, there is the possibility that Gamma can just run them down because they do have a, a much better mix of, of damage to burst through a deal with SK Gaming. Candy Panda still farming as well, trying to get himself back close. 70 CS yeah, so He's really, really struggling in that one, and it's going to take some time before he starts to wrap things up there. And we'll see how that Blade of the Moon Kingdom mentioned earlier that he's definitely working towards us. Still not being complete. In fact, Genja is pushed fairly far up the lane here and they need to be a little bit careful about that. And we've seen before that Genja has been caught out in this kind of position where he's kind of got comfy in uh, his position. He's pushed right up the lane. Now he's got Edward with him though. Got a couple of wards down as well, but not really have much vision if Sven's gonna actually came around there. They don't, but I think what Edward was trying to do is waiting to react to anybody diving on Genja. It actually looked like they wanted to try to set up a fight. The one thing to note is, as far as levels is concerned, Genja has a two-level advantage over Candy Panda because of all of that excessive CS lead. And there is a fair amount of burst potential. With the Gragas barrels and the Culling and Blade Thurster, he could be in trouble. We do see two members of SK that are looking for a fight to Nick, Nick and Jezus. Back Jezus coming in that slow. Connecting on towards Nick, but he's not having any problems with that one whatsoever. Nasha's two for him already done. He needs his large rod also picked up here. There is Sven's good. Just getting rid of the pick ward down on the back of that Baron pit, which don't think Baron's going to be coming into play for this one. A fairly slow one in terms of the amount of kills and how fast the game is progressing in terms of towers as well. It is, and I want to touch on that new large rod that Nick picked up. Yesterday when we seen Kale, we seen the newer uh, flavor build on Kale, where it was Nash's 2 into Brunon's Hurricane. And it just, it's a combination of items that allows you to get a lot of damage to multiple targets. And of course, because the Hurricane applies on the effects, Kale's going to be able to get Lich Flame, uh, the passive procs rather to reduce armor and magic resist, so it gets even more damage over time. That's not the build Nick's gone with. He's going for more of the upfront burst damage. And I think it's a smart choice. If he gets caught out by a knockup, a leasing kick, a Yasuo kick, he may not get the time to get a multitude of auto attacks off. Edward playing with fire, I think, as three members about to collapse. He may die here. Good flash. Very good flash. Completely confusing. SK came in there like, huh? where, where, <laughs> what? where have they gone? And then now they're pushing down on towards their Rachel in the bomb. He's going to pop his ultimate. Freddy gets involved as well. But there's a lot of damage back on towards Freddy. Colleen comes out. Not going to be enough to pop the blood well. And SK Gaming trying to move as many men down there as they can. This could be a big push from Gambit. That was such a massive win for Gambit. They got the teleport from Freddy. They got flash and heal from Candy Panda. They got flash from Enraged. And they burned all of SK's ultimates. So with Dragon being up in a minute and a half, Gambit are going to have the summoner spell advantage by, a, a, as you said, a country mile already if they pick those engages. So that was very smart play. That just started with an opportunity. Just started with... Edward saying, well, let's let's see what we can do, rather, see what we can, uh, sorry, Diamond rather, saying, let's see if we can jump on them. And they managed to get all of those summoner spells blown, as well as those ultimates. Well, I just wanted to touch on Jezus there as well, that Blade of the Rune King, second item. So, going more the way that we've seen a few of the Korean Yasuo players going, rather than Static Shiv into the Infinity Edge and going full on crit and, you know, more damage in there. 
Going for that Blade of the Ruin King gives him that bit more sustain and also chase ability as well, something that we can't ever forget. Yeah, and his Q scales off attack speed as well, so it, it, it does synergize with his kit. Oh, it, Eddie. it also gives him uh, the ability to chase. Eddie's going to get kicked backwards, that's a dead fat man. Yeah, he's not got his flash because he used that one earlier on. Actually, a lot of health coming back towards him and the intervention coming in as well. Don't ever say the fat man's dead before the fat man goes down. That is the truth, and the explosive cost once again. Yesterday, it's what Edward was doing over and over, and he would reset team fights. The Black Shield wasn't there to keep Jezus in Edward's face. It means he's going to you know, get away with his life. So Dragon's up in five seconds. SK look like they want to challenge for this one. They are 4,000 gold down. Candy Pan has got a Blade of the Rune King, so if he comes up from the river, he will have the uh, power to fight. But please take note, no Dragon's Rage, no Last Breath for Yasuo Lee Sin. So again, SK behind on Summoners, behind on Key Ultimates. I don't think they can pick this fight even if they want to. Darian has come down from this one. Dragon's gonna be started up by Gambit. And as you rightly pointed out, there's nothing here for SK in terms of the Dragon. They are, however, going towards this mid lane air. Gambit might try and come around the back of them, though. Yeah, I think SK could be in trouble if any CC lands. It doesn't look like uh, Gambit can get an easy target, though. There's a very mobile team on SK. And because you can have a lot of people jumping over walls and dashing around. It's difficult to lock them down. The rest of Gambit, they found three SK. And then Diamond down to Enray to the end. I'm not sure that he's going to escape. He's Edward that actually picks up the kill in the end. There's the kick, but that's going to get Diamond <laughs> over the wall with him. It's Nick in the end that blasts down Svenskren. That's two kills for nothing here for Gambit and the tower. SK Gaming tried to get a tower when they uh, realized they couldn't challenge for Dragon. Because of the position that they were in, they ran the opposite direction and exposed their middle lane. Gambit, no hesitation, great calling, great decision making there actually to shove them down and they managed to grab two towers out of it as well as two kills. Very smart, decisive play from Gambit. This is a completely different Gambit to what we saw yesterday here. Kind of not actually recall in there behind enemy lines. Well, well, I mean, it's his jungle, but not really since Gambit have got all the towers down there. Let's have a look at this one once again. It's Diamond starting it off. And it's just SK. They didn't have the information to work with. I mean, the minion wave had only just gone to that uh, uh, portion of the map. So unfortunately for SK, they just got found out. You know, the, their route was too readable and Gambit were in the right place at the right time. So very smart play from Gambit. They've got a very, very good lead. And I also like the fact that their team can tower dive. You can have Irelia or Evelyn uh, forcing an objective and just use Gragas and Kale to keep them alive if things go wrong, if things go a bit wonky. So very, very good comp to maintain control as long as Gambit don't give SK time because Vayne can become scary. Yasuo can become scary as well. 7,000 gold. Uh, they're about to lose the Gambit holding on to. Five to one in kills as well. Almost a mirror image of what happened to them against Rockout. Although this is definitely not as one-sided as that game. Let's not pretend about that. SK actually trying to push back here and get themselves a third story of the game. They need to be careful though. Gambit starting to come into the side there. It's going to be Freddy that's the initial target. Whoa, the damage coming his way. He's actually going to get his blood well popped, but getting away from it is probably not a possibility. And Rated has also gone down. And now Freddy is on the run to try and escape this one. Up towards the enemy base. Meanwhile, SK taking a turret in the mid lane as well. And Freddy continues to run here. Very possible that he's going to get executed. Yeah, I think the time is just quickly enough. And has it worked? It has. So denies a kill, allows the rest of his team to get a tower. Jesus and Spence can be collapsed upon. Here comes Diamond. Diamond around the side. Genja actually getting knocked up there. That will stop his input on towards his fight. But Edward also moving in from the side. He's got his ultimate available. Jesus is doing a lot of damage to Genja. The intervention coming around. And Jesus now. Now, good knock-up on the two people, but escaping from the Evelyn, pretty much impossible. And it is Diamond that gets the kill. In the meantime, Spenskrum went down as well. Jezus has fallen. Freddy is down, of course, from the execute. And Gamet are going barren. Very, very smart play from Gamet. They managed to regroup, reposition, and grab themselves all of the kills. They're going to get the Barret uncontested. And a very smart pickup on the Kale. That was a second round pick for Gambit after they'd seen the Yasuo. And we touched on how Yasuo is a counter to the likes of Nidalee, especially during the laning phase. But once you've got a burst assassin and a champion with intervention like Kale, all of a sudden, Yasuo is going to be next to useless. He can't execute. All of the damage still applied, but he couldn't get the final blows, and that's what mattered. So Nick 
with a very smart choice, and he's definitely showing up now in game two. 302. He's done well in CS. He's got a lot of damage. Opted to go for the Zonya's Hourglass, so he's even got more survivability himself. And it's all gathered. This game has really just been about them from the get go. And the Randuin's in there starting to pile up as well. One for Darien, one for Diamond. Already makes them so much harder to kill when you play full physical damage team here. This game, gaming half. Scambit starts to push down this middle lane as well. Top lane's going to be pushed out by Nick, and he's going to be having himself a free throw. Nothing they can do to stop him on that front. No, nothing at all. And now you've also got Nick that can split push quite effectively. Once he gets his Lich Bane completed, he's going to be able to just melt his towers as well. So, you know, smart, smart optimization. The only arm and penetration that's on the card so far is with Jezus. He's got the pickaxe and the longsword. You are wild a little bit before he gets that uh, last whisper. But the rest of SK need to get some armor pen. Gonna lose another tower, as they don't want to pick a fight against a team with uh, Baron and obviously a 10k gold. Big, big gold lead. Uh, sat on right now. And moving towards that inhibitor turret here. Still dangerous for them, They need to be a little bit careful of how deep they go. Darien looked like he's itching to get involved there. Yes, as long as Enrated is at the tower, I'm not sure Gambit will tower dive. You don't want to dive in Morgana with that Soul Shackles. It's a very, very powerful ultimate in that situation. So if Enrated gets poked out, if Enrated takes some burst damage maybe from Nick and uh, leaves the area like he does now, that's going to allow Gambit to tower dive. Smart play by Diamond, force SK to react, leave that top lane. Obviously, there's no minions to work with either. So let's see if Gambit can force SK to uh, a fight. Well, they got to force him to give up an inhibitor. That's uh, one thing for them at least. They move back around on towards this top lane. Pink Ward going to be taken as well. Oh, Diamond on Emily. We can see pretty much pushing that one alone. Darian in the middle of the team. Where's the rest of the team though? Gambit not even close to being involved in that one, but they've managed to force him back. And Rater going to get knocked back through. And he's licked the picks of the kill. He's now on a rampage at 4 0 2. This is going to be a second inning, Tori. There's no doubt about it. Without that Soul Shackles to threaten Gambit and maybe disperse them, there's nothing SK can do. You have to give props to Genja. He's about to get condemned in the wall and actually flashed over it. While flying from that condemn, he managed to get away from the wall. Had he been stunned, that could have allowed a knock-up to land in place and then obviously uh, uh, Yasuo to jump in there, but it didn't happen. Gamma grabbed themselves two inhibitors from that last trade. Baron is just about to wear off, and my word is Gambit rich. 3,000 gold for Nick, 3,000 gold for Genja. They're just going to spend that and just get even further. Gonna come back in all the more powerful from this on see what items actually do end up being purchased. The Sunfire King picked up there for Diamond on Evelyn. And we'll see a dragon going down as well. Lich Bane was finished off by Nick as well. And uh, well, they're taking the dragon with Nick. He's got, he's got even more gold to spend when he goes back here in just a second. Instant recalls from everyone from Gambit. So just to list the items that have been completed, you mentioned Nick with the Lich Bane. Thornmail completed for Irelia. Randian's Omen completed for Edward on Gragas. Gen just grabbed himself an Infinity Edge. So just listing a few small, uh, insignificant items that Gambit has put together. And, you know, they already were miles and miles ahead. That is the tools that they need now to, to force down the last inner turret. And I'm expecting them to just group bottom lane, wait for super minions to get in the middle of the top, and, and look to land the killing blow against this game. Well, in that last fight inside the base, you can even really call it a fight. It was just Darian having fun pretty much around the entire team. He didn't really take all that much damage. I thought he's miles away from the rest of the team. He's surely going to get caught out. Well, not really what happened, to be honest. He survived long enough there for them to uh, mop up a couple of kills. But now he's got himself that four mail as well. Makes it a lot more uh, difficult to take him down. Look at that statistic. 0.14 KDA versus Rockat yesterday. A 32 KDA versus SK today. Night and day for Gamma. That is fantastic, and, and Gamma deserve it. I mean, from the very, the very first few ganks that we've seen from them, they've, they've, they've pushed the objectives correctly. 
it looks like they're playing the game today. Yesterday they really did it. So, tower's down, it looks like they're gonna force a fight. Super minions on the Nexus. Going out towards Candy Piner. Actually, Genji gonna take a lot of damage here and will be able to go down. It's Candy Piner that gets that kill. Nick also taking a lot of damage from this one. He will end up falling. Diamond gonna go low. SK Gaming manages to pick up three kills here. It's gonna be four as well. Edwin won't get away from this one. A double for Jezus, but look at the base. The Super Minion have taken down both Nexus turrets. And they're going to be able to put some damage down as well. At the end of the day, Gambit simply just got a little spread up. There was a good ultimate for Jezus in and amongst the fight, and we touched on the fact that there is a ticking time bomb. Bane is eventually going to get scary. There is damage in multiple sources for SK. Gambit didn't blow somebody up. They didn't pop anyone, and that was the key in that fight. Unfortunately for Gambit, a little overzealous, I feel. But at the end of the day, SK holding on by the absolute skin of the team. They have no turrets left. The, the one I will look at is Nick very, very quickly. Genji gets caught out. He's the only target of the last breath. But then the following knockup is key. Genji's about to get focused up fairly quickly on. He doesn't get many auto attacks off. And once the intervention, as well as Hourglass, wear off, SK are very tight to group. There's no focus for Gambit. I mean, this is such a, a sloppy fight, and if you look at his game, there are four blue health bars around the threats of Gambit, the entirety of that fight. And it just boils down to poor targeting in team fights, which you could possibly uh, credit to maybe being less experienced as a team. You can, uh, hell, I'm going to go a step further. Maybe whatever they were calling, they weren't on the same page. You know, Nick, we don't know how fluent he is in Russian yet, if at all. So, poor team fight for Gambit but maybe too far ahead for that team fight yeah. to have an overall impact, I think, maybe on this game. 11-4 up in turrets, 62 to 50,000 gold, and Baron is coming into play here. SK Gaming pushing up that middle wave. Are they going to go for a bit of a positional play on this one? Go up towards it as Edward going to get involved. They've managed to single out Freddy here. Does have his blood well available. And Jez is actually going to pick himself up a kill. This could be real bad news for Gambit once again. Ultimate goes down from Morgana. Darian is going to die. Edward off to the side will be finished off by Candy Panda. And again, it's three kills coming in for SK Gaming. Nick got killed before he could use intervention. There are no super minions to deal with. So SK are going to grab free reign on the Baron. It does doesn't look like Diamond is going to be able to get to the challenge, and even if he does, this is going to be a god-like steal. SK Gaming with Baron can defend. SK Gaming with Baron, the value that it gives you in stats, will make that 10,000 gold difference significantly less. So all of a sudden, SK can. That was the team fight that has given SK a, 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 a last attempt at life, and we'll need to see if if, if they can play perfectly, there is no room for error. Look at Nick. Focus very, very carefully on Nick. Freddy gets closer, gets the knockup, and an instant reaction from Jezus. Nick goes down before he can hourglass, before he can intervention. And because Bloodwell was up, Freddy's just like, hey, cool beans, I'll respawn. Soul Shackles has just stunned you because you're all in my, my face, and they clean up house. Very good team fight, a very good reaction from SK to just realize, look, we have to all in, or it's going to go badly. Genji was out of the fight anyway from the beginning, but Svenskun took him even further out there, just going straight for him, forced him to back away towards his own jungle, and meant that wasn't really a factor in that one. So, very, very interesting turn of events. It's 9 8 in kills, still a big gold lead here for Gambit, although that has now come back to below a 10,000 gold lead. So, I've cast enough Gambit games in my life to never call a game over before it's over. Yes, that's the truth. But SK, SK now have, I think, the confidence and the, the gold value that they need to actually be relevant. Now we've got an even fight in our hands. Up until that previous Baron, Gambit had a significant lead, obviously. The key to these team fights is going to hinge entirely on which team can blow up their opposition's, I think, 80 carry first. If Genji is given time and free reign to get multiple auto attacks off, get protected by intervention and, you know, allow Edward to disperse SK Gaming, he can kill multiple members. Same story for Candy Panda. If Candy Panda is given time to get those auto attacks off, he can kill his opponent. So let's keep our eyes on Nick's uh, interventions and his hourglass usage because that previous fight would have been very different if he'd come back. Would have been very different if, if he'd actually managed to cast a couple of spells. For SK Gaming, nothing that Gambit can do about this one. It's going to bring the gold to a little bit closer. And of course, everyone nearing six items at this point is outside of the support. So 
That gold total is going to become less and less important in the overall factor when it comes to these team fights. And Candy Panda, we talked about him ramping up, still miles behind him. So yes, that's kind of been the theme of this game for him so far. But he's got himself Trinity Force, Blade of the Ring King, got a Brutalizer as well. So a little bit of a different build that we're seeing here from Candy Panda. We talked about armor penetration and how he needed to get his hands on some. Yeah. Brutalizer is actually going to be quite good for the CDR for his tumbles, for his ultimate as well. But what I quite like is if he does actually upgrade that to the likes of a uh, Black Cleaver, the armor shred will allow the rest of his team to do more damage as well. So there are ways to mitigate some of the armor on Gambit, but there is still a lot of armor to burn through. So there is no room for error. I would say for both of these teams, at 40 minutes in the game, with so many auto attack based champions, towers and inhibitors will just get melted. So. A, Neither team can afford to get caught out or uh, blown up before a real fight can break out. Just want to make sure that this top wave doesn't do too much damage on towards the tower. They're going to go in for Edward here. A lot of damage coming his way. Darien in the middle. Intervention news. Nick at the back is hammering away. Jez is forced away. Slenskorn's going to go down here. Surely great flash away over the top of the wall from him. The Colin won't do too much damage there towards Freddy. SK disengaged. Didn't lose a man either. That was a bit overzealous from the side of SK Gaming. They tried to force a tower dive and all credit to Sven Skerin. His Dragon Rage actually knocked up Darren during the course of the fight. Kicked Edward back, they got two members of Gambit up in the air and Jezus came in there. But underneath the tower, with the power of intervention, they couldn't actually secure the kill. So, good attempt, but I think SK managed to get away quite cleanly. Look at this, Edward's about to get kicked up, knocks up Darian actually as well. That was a very nice timing on that last breath of Jezus. But as we said, underneath the tower, the rate of tanking as best as possible. Because there was no insta-give, the team fight is not gonna is not gonna work out. The front line of SK wasn't there. Freddy was very late to the party. He was only making his way up from that middle lane uh, uh, towards the end of the engagement. So good attempt. And I actually think lucky that no one in SK died because it was very deep. To avoid that in the future here as well. Two GAs picked up, one for Freddy. Basically means he's got two GAs. He's got three lives now with that Bloodwell in there as well. Svenskun, the second man to pick himself up a Guardian Angel. Candy Panda actually turning that Brutalizer into the Black Cleaver there. In the end, it's Genja actually going to get binded up. But in the end, it's Gambit that are going aggressive from this one. Looks like they want to have a good go at Freddy. Still has that GA, still has his blood well as they go towards Diamond. Binding will land, but I don't think SK really want to be a part of this fight. They're going to back off again. SK are backing away. It's actually interesting to see those GAs because SK needs more time to burn through all of the armor of Gambit. Because each of their auto attacks will be mitigated by all of the itemization on Gambit, the ability to respawn and come back is going to be very important. But what SK need to do is, if someone goes down with that GA, they have to cluster around their teammates and make sure that when he respawns, they can continue the fight on that corpse or on that location. If SK bail away and run back like we've seen in both of the previous engagements, Gambit are just going to stay clustered, use Edward's explosive cost to displace SK and kill the target. So there's a lot of importance for SK to, to remain grouped. They can't afford to split up. Also has come back down to 7,000 here, so just showing you the swing that SK have managed to pick up in this match. Again, the tug of war basically in this mid lane as Darian going to take a lot of damage. Candy Panda needs to be careful how far forward he goes. He's not the person that they want to lose at the start of a fight. Definitely not. And if SK had towers to play with, I think they could have even gone for a split push strategy. They could have gone, you know, uh, uh, pull Gamut apart, try and make them come to us. But because SK have got nothing to work with, they don't even have Nexus turrets. If they are out of position for any period of time, they are at the risk of being uh, backdoored. Very important in that previous fight in that mid lane in a turret, Darren used his teleport. So what that means is if Gambit do get some deep vision, the risk or the, the, the play of going for that backdoor and inhibitor is not available to them. So SK have got a small timing, a small window of opportunity where they're uh, Reprieve where they're safe from that type of uh, move. Although I don't really associate with Gambit, to be fair, either. No, no, not particularly. They, they want to team fight and then win yeah. the game that way. That's more likely than not. <laughs> I think that's more likely the uh, scenario from that one. Uh, second Thorn Mail actually in there for Gambit as well now with Evelyn. The first Guardian Angel on their side actually been picked up by Genja. So a lot more survivability added in for the AD carry. 
could be interesting now. Moving up towards the Baron. Another GA picked up here for Jezza. So we're at that stage of the game where the team fight is basically the last half a day. There's a very scary fight in this Baron pit. Oh, we may see a repeat. If there are multiple targets knocked up by SK, there's nothing you can do to mitigate that. They're starting a fight. Freddy's starting a fight, but he's starting a fight on his own. The rest of the team not really coming in. Barrel comes out from Eddie to knock everyone else away. They're doing some good damage here. And there is the ultimate out of Enrage. And is he going to fall? No, the knockup comes in. Eddie's going to take a lot of damage. First kill going over towards Gambit. Well, there's one back on towards Nick. Well, this is good work from Gambit. They're going to get the uh, GA out of Svenskun. They're going to pick up the kill. Possibly no. Freddy's still doing damage. And there's a double kill for Jesus. He still has a Guardian Angel available. In the end, as I said, half a day long fight. It's SK that come out on top. It could have been so much better if Jesus had hit more people with that last breath. It was not the strongest. I'm hoping we get a replay because I think he only caught Edward at the beginning of the fight. Because of all of the survives and the revives for those GAs, that fight went on for an eternity. Baron's being secured, so what I need to keep my eyes on now is Jezus and his last breath. We'll have to see how it plays out. We do see that Freddy, as you highlighted Joe, is going to be in trouble. Oh, they're going for Baron. Oh, they're going for Baron. It's very low. I see Darian coming in. Jezus going to get his Guardian Angel poke. They're leaving Genja alone here. Genja is hammering away at him. Svenskun's come back towards the Baron. But is he going to go down? Baron is going to be picked up by SK. Well, they've been aced. That can be game. Enrated is up. It's going to be up to Enrated and Candy Panda to defend against Genja and Darian. If they go for the inhibitor, there is some time to play with. It looks like Genji and Darian are making a beeline for that mid lane inhibitor while Enrated is wave clearing on the bottom. Candy Panda, you need to run, my friend, because this is a scary position to be in. I think wise play from Gambit. Oh, Back he's managed to land the bind in there. Darian's a dead man here, surely. Kill is picked up by Candy Panda, and now they go towards Genji. He's going to get his GA pop, first of all. Eventually! What? <laughs> what? Why? Why did that take so long for them there in the end? There he comes back up and Genja He's alive! Last second intervention! He survives it! There's still 20 seconds on the three men from SK. It's, that's going to be an inhibitor. Gambit have got enough members in this mid lane now to grab themselves an inhibitor. And if they want to commit, they should be able to get the Nexus as well. Nick is moving. Can he dead? Oh, he's dead. That surely is game here. Gambit going to go in for it. Massive, massive win for Gambit. It took them a while. SK gave them everything. And in the end, it's Gambit that get the win. Fantastic game. 45 minutes long. Real thriller. Phenomenal play. Barring one or two team fights that went awry when they had that Baron. Gave SK a, a, a shot back into the game, but that was incredibly exciting. And you know what? Gambit deserved the win. From the way they played the first 25 minutes, they completely, completely grabbed control of the game. And we're, we're toying, toying with throwing it away. Crazy, crazy ending to that one. I thought that SK had managed to hold them up there as they took down Darian and then I still don't quite know what took Genja so long to die in that one. It was almost as if they thought they'd already popped his GA, kind of stopped focusing him for a second. He's like, no, I'm still alive, still doing damage. Fully stacked Bloodthirster, Infinity Edge, just he's sustained through so much damage. And you know, heart, heartbroken looks in the faces of SK. They, they, they had a real comeback on the cards. Mm -hmm. They had, uh, you know, Barons back to back. They had team fights that really pushed Gambit to the limit. And it, it all just came down to that very, very final fight. I'd love to see a replay again because I'm, I'm pretty confident, very confident, that that last breath only caught Edward. And had that been on carries, had that been on Genja, had that been on Nick, could have won the that game. Middle, that would have been game. I mean, that would have been game. We've seen how long that team fight dr was drawn out, and uh, it just it didn't work in favor of, of uh, uh, SK Gaming. And kind of went as we thought it would here. SK Gaming, we said it before the game, that they're not a team that traditionally does extremely well in lane phase. No. They're a team that sometimes come out on top more than often, you know, around about even. In this one, they were just pretty much nowhere near Gambit on that one. However, when we started to get towards the later stages of it, there we saw the real concentrated SK game. But as you said, that one fight there where, okay, they managed to knock up Edward and, and lay down the law onto him. But if that had landed onto two people, maybe, if they'd have yeah. pulled off an ASF, they would have won that game. I agree. I completely agree. And I think for SK, they really need to figure out how to... to to do better in the early stages. Mm. You know, there are so many times, uh, we see it at this game, we've seen it yesterday, we've seen it in the spring split, where 
the laning phase is just a, a time where they, they do fall behind, especially when it comes to those, those dragons and giving up kills. I do think their composition was risky anyway. They had an all physical composition. Mm. They needed Yasuo and Vayne to get a lot of items. I mean, before Yasuo was a real threat, he needs at least an infinity, uh, a static shift minimum and maybe an Infinity Edge, maybe, in this case, it was a Blade of the Rune King. Then he can become scary. But it, that's a big window of time to say, okay, look, let's not lose the game in this 26 minutes that it takes yeah. to hit that spike. And unfortunately, because it took so long, uh, Gambit just kept getting more advantages and, and further ahead. And I have to wonder, going back to your, your point about they need a stronger laning phase here, we always say about SK that they're not a team full of superstars. They're a team that plays so incredibly well together as a team. And maybe that whole that whole style is what costs them because in the, the 1v1 in the mid lane, the 1v1 in the top lane, that's where they're pretty much losing out in these games. And it's sometimes you kind of hit your level when it comes to skill and SK Gaming, we know they can do it when yeah. it comes to team fighting as a team, but they need to step it up when it comes to those early games, to, to those 1v1 pure skill areas. Yeah, I completely agree. And if, if they can't do it in that regard, then look for lane swaps, look mm. for invades, look for things in the opening minutes of the game that give you the situation you want. Because once you're in control and you're dictating the tempo and the pace, everything's on your terms, everything's on your time, everything's with you in control. In this game, it wasn't. And SK were very uh, incapable of arresting control back. Well, we are going to head over onto the stage where Shox is waiting for a chat with Gambit. Thank you very much, Joe. I'm joined here by Edward after that game. You buried your head in your hands after that. What a game. Talk me through the last moments and how you guys were able to close it out. It was so exciting. Yeah, the game was super close. The last moment when we killed uh, on Baron three, three people, uh, we, t we just say, Darren, just don't die here. And he went through, take the bind binding, and we just, oh my god. He got cut and he died, but it was enough time for us to come in and finish the game. I was super excited to win this game. Did you uh, talk to Genja during that? Because you were responding and walking back, and he he was left alive for so long. Uh, you mean the barn fight? Right, no, right at the end when you guys went for the Nexus. Yeah, we, I, I know. We just said, just finish the game, nothing else. Don't kill anyone. Uh, talk me through how you guys went into this game, because obviously yesterday, not the best start for you guys. Yeah, the yesterday game was, I think if we just rematch the game yesterday, it was be, it would be like a one-sided game for us, because we practiced a lot of our team comp with what we picked. We just, the problem was uh, that Genja waited two summers early on, so we couldn't do anything. And Diamond get, got cut, so game just didn't, get, didn't go well from for first minutes. But you guys definitely did very well here today. Talk me through how the beginning of the season has been for you personally. Obviously, you guys had to leave Alex behind. He chose to leave and bringing in the new mid laner here, Nick. Yeah, it's so much pressure for four players in Gambit who was in Gambit. We just have to carry and just show Nick that we're comfortable with him, so he won't feel uncomfortable. And uh, I don't know, just we need to do our best to first week. All right, well, the best of luck to you guys, and thank you very much. Thank you. All right, as for us, we're going to take a short break after that exciting game. After the break, though, we have the Copenhagen Wolves versus Millennium, and we're going to break down this match, so don't go anywhere. Oh, Genja, don't go. <laughs> oh, this is bad, bad news for Darian. Will he get away? Oh! Wow! <laughs> they found three SK. And then Diamond melts when Ray to the end. I'm not sure that he's going to escape. It's Edward that actually picks up the kill in the end. There's the kick, but that's going to get Diamond over the wall with him. It goes towards it as Edward is going to get involved. They've managed to single out Freddy here. Does have his blood well available. And Jenna's actually going to pick himself up a kill. This could be real bad news for Gambit once again. Eventually! What? <laughs> what? Why? Why did that take so long for him there in the end? There he comes back up again. He's alive! Classic intervention! 